Shalom. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. This morning, uh, we have Jean George, uh, who will reiterate the important points and summarize uh, what she shared last week on helping someone with suicidal thoughts. And after she shares, we will um, open up the time for all of you to ask any questions, uh, doubts uh, that you may have on what is shared or what she's explained. Um, so before I hand over the time to Jean, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, can I ask any one of our students to lead us in prayer, please? Can one of you please lead us in prayer? Diksha, are you there? Can you lead us in prayer, please? Good morning, Edwin. Uh, let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just once again thank you for this hour of mentoring and pray, Father, as you minister to us through your word, Father, that we will be able to learn what you're teaching us in this time of learning and be able to apply the same in our lives, Father. We we pray for blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. I appreciate your enthusiasm and your willingness always to uh, lead us in prayer. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, Jean George this morning. And as I said, she will just re reiterate uh, the important points, what she shared last week on um, helping someone with suicidal thoughts and just summarize everything that she shared. Uh, so over to Jean. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, it's great to be here. I know we didn't have too much of time for questions last week. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll open up for time for more questions. But then I thought I'll just take maybe the first five to six minutes, just quickly going through what was shared. I won't be going into detail, but just uh, a couple of points that uh, I had shared the last time. Um, I, I think I, I want to start with just uh, sharing that, you know, the, the reason why it's important to deal with a subject like this is because of the alarming rates of uh, suicides that have happened and that have been recorded over the years. So the statistic shows that there, there was a 27% jump uh, of suicides compared to 2018 as as uh, which was recorded in 2022 that was the last time uh, you know the the reports came out so uh, there were 1.71 lakh suicides that were recorded in 2022 so it it becomes uh, a, a really important subject to uh, to understand and to know because uh, we may be sitting next to people uh, who probably have uh, maybe even attempted suicide or probably even are contemplating it so uh, just to just to uh, quickly reiterate what we what we looked at um, there were two verses that you know i just brought up basically for us to understand that god is the owner and giver of life and uh, these verses reiterate that um, that god is our creator and he's the only one who is to decide when and how a person should die um, so that's something that we understand and we believe uh, and that's what that's why we believe that there is sanctity to to life. Um, moving ahead, we quickly looked at uh, the definition of these uh, three words, suicide. Uh, it, it's a death that's caused by injuring oneself with the specific intention to die. A suicide attempt is when someone harms themselves with an intent to die or to end their life, but they do not die uh, as a result of, of their actions. Or su and suicidal thoughts or ideations are having thoughts about ending life um, or feeling that people would be better off without them. So it can uh, it may mean they are thinking about methods of suicide or making plans on how they could take their own life. Um, we looked also at uh, how before before we understand how we can support. What is it? Or how do we learn about uh, warning signs that we need to? understand what are indications or warning signs that people may come up with. So being informed about these warning signs often can help us support people before they attempt a suicide. So 
just divided into three in the way that they talk. They may be uh, they may talk about how they're experiencing unbearable pain. Uh, they may be talking about how they're a burden to others, that they desire to end their lives, um, that there isn't any purpose for their life or a sense of just feeling trapped in life. Uh, so this is through the language probably that they use. Uh, then you you can find uh, have certain warning signs through their behavior. <clears throat> they may be withdrawing from regular activities. It may be work. It may be social settings. It may be uh, some things that they've always been uh, uh, very involved in. There could be an increase in substance use, either it be alcohol or drugs. Uh, they could be actually looking for ways to kill themselves, like they may be searching online um, for how how people die, or searching for materials uh, or or means um, or on on dying. There are other things that you will notice is maybe they sleep too much, sleep too little. The mood seems to be generally altered. Um, they may visit or call people to say their last goodbyes. They may write their will. They may give away their prized possessions. They may close down certain um, accounts and you know ensure that it goes to important members of the family, uh, or they could be aggression. So these are some behaviors we'd see. We also look at mood. Um, moods are generally depression, or it could be irritability, humiliation, or anxiety, um, irritability. Any of these things are what you would find as the uh, warning signs. How do we support? Um, there are certain simple actions that can actually help us to really help someone experience suicidal thoughts. And the first one is actually to ask and find out. Um, this is basically to ask whether the, uh, to know whether the person is in danger of acting on their suicidal feelings. And it's perfectly um, uh, uh, right and good and studied. There is evidence that you need, you can actually ask them because that in itself could protect them. It's it's a way of how they may be crying out for help. So, but you know, being sensitive on asking questions. The last time I had put down a couple of questions, uh, you can actually go back to last week's recording and probably find that. The next thing we need to do is to listen, and that's the best way to offer support. It's to uh, be with them, not arguing, not minimizing their pain, not offering advice, but just listening and being present. It is. Uh, when you do that, you're letting the person know that you are there as a support without judgment um, and you are there to, to help. Then comes determining. You know, you, you need to determine uh, how severe these suicidal thoughts are. And we spoke about four factors. We said intent, that is uh, the, the intention that they have to die. You know, they, they may say something like, I want to end my life. I have come to that point for decision. Uh, the second thing is a plan. They may have uh, created a plan as to how they will do it, where they're going to do it, what what they're going to do. You know, what are the what are the kind of uh, uh, things that they have arranged for. So that's the second one, plans. The third is means. Means is the access they have uh, to doing this. You know, it may be some kind of a weapon. It can be maybe some kind of a lethal measure or something that they know. They they've got all of that ready. And last is the timeline. They have picked a day and a time and a um, and a and a place to do that. So intent, plan, means, and uh, timeline are the are the uh, is what you will determine when someone may be expressing these thoughts. The next one is to notify. Notify is to really um, get the support of somebody else, especially, you know, if, if especially if let's say you're on a phone call or maybe you're meeting them uh, uh, the first time and you, you have no background of them, to actually enlist the support of a family member. This is one time you can breach confidentiality because, uh, you know, th they're, the, their life is at at stake, and uh, your, you, that's your interest uh, to ensure that they they are safe. So notifying somebody uh, who can actually keep them safe or who can give them help them to get into treatment, and of course, is to the the one is to keep praying to let the person know that God cares for them in their situation. Um, that you know it, it would be good to keep to keep 
um, engaged and stay connected with them, uh, I, either you know through through your support of prayer or through finding out ways of how they can get the support that they want. So suicide prevention begins with care, begins with caring enough for people to know that you notice that something has gone wrong, and um, uh, that that's what we actively need to keep focusing on as uh, as we figure out how to support the last one uh, that you know i quickly went through is um how can we as churches prevent suicide the first thing we discussed is uh, to to deal with misconceptions to to understand misconceptions about suicide and faith because sometimes it can misinform those who are actually dealing with suicidal thoughts and people may believe that their depression or what they're going through is a sign of a lack of faith and uh, this can cause secondary guilt uh, especially to those having this condition. So uh, maybe just uh, an advice of, you know, just pray or have faith um, or, you know, trust in God more uh, may may not be enough uh, because that may just, it may, it may just look like an accusation that, you know, they aren't doing, doing enough. The, we understand that even Christians, even believers are not immune to mental health challenges. And sometimes um, there is no guarantee uh, against that depression, but it is to help them to tide through that. The second one is to encourage that they get support. You know? And one way is that how we can combat the stigma is by encouraging those having depression or any form of anxiety to seek help, to seek uh, uh, help that is appropriate to their needs, whether it be medical treatment, or whether it be um, uh, counseling help, whether it be pastoral care, whether it be group support, whatever that, whatever that is, you know, to ensure that they get that support. And just to also share that we at Chrysalis, uh, which is a part of uh, ABC, we have a list of qualified counselors, psychiatrists, experts in the city that can be helpful. So that's something that uh, as a church we can do. And last of all, but most important, is to bring hope. Um, because we as a church are responsible to really show out and demonstrate the love of God to those who are hurting. And we can seek out those who are struggling and make that intentional effort to be with them, to listen, to offer that encouragement, to pray them through, to encourage them in the word, to get the kind of support that they that they need in, in order for them to really manage their mental health challenges. So th these were some of the things that we had discussed last time. And now I, I'd just like to open it up for further questions. Um, yes, over to you, Pastor Selina. Thank you very much, Jean, uh, for sharing on this very important uh, topic. You know, uh, the suicidal rates are very, very alarming. Uh, even in our city, in Bangalore, it's very alarming to see uh, young children, uh, you know, ending their lives. And, um, you know, most of us are very genuinely interested in helping, uh, uh, you know, people who are uh, going through suicidal thoughts or you know planning to end their lives but we don't feel competent but uh, thank you for sharing those uh, valuable tips that can help us to move ahead uh, we'll open up this time for any of you uh, who have any questions or you have a case scenario that you would like to present and uh, you want Jean to help you how you can take this forward and how you can help the person uh, you can either uh, type it out in the chat section or you can unmute your mics and uh, ask your questions. So the time is opened for all of you. If you have any doubts, uh, you want Jean to even explain something that you haven't understood, you could go ahead. Uh, yes, Kofi. Yes, sister. Uh, uh, my question is, in case someone is in such a position, a suicide, and then you show care to that person, and the person later on falls in love with you because of the caring that you are showing, how do you handle such situation? Okay, thank you, Kofi. 
Um, so, um, with, with, with what you have shared, what I'm supposing is, or, or let's say, when a, when a person is attempting suicide, they're definitely in a, a significant emotional pain. And sometimes this, uh, the situation that you're talking about could probably arise from someone who's had a difficult or a breakup of a relationship. And, um, uh, and as a result, you know, when you have stepped in and you've provided that care and support, then that attachment comes about. Um, so I think one of the important things, and especially when, when uh, we as ministers um, minister to people, my suggestion, especially if you're not professionally trained, my suggestion is that you hand over the person, um, maybe in, after your initial conversation of really understanding that they are in a, a difficult place and you know that there are these thoughts of suicide, is to hand them over to uh, to a woman. Like, I suppose that you're talking about someone who's a who's a woman who's uh, actually sharing with you. Uh, a good idea would be to hand them over to someone else who's a, who's a lady, who's a woman, who can actually support and help them. Especially when they're going through relationship breakdowns, uh, the fact that there is someone caring and someone understanding them through the situation are chances for them to form a certain attachment to you. So the if, if you once you've done the preliminary work, once you've understood that a person has suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideations, or maybe going through some form of depression and anxiety, it may be good to release them over to a, a woman or to a lady to support and help them so so we can avoid these kind of issues especially um when when there is when you may not be professionally trained um so in professional tra training there are certain signs or certain certain uh, indications that a therapist or a counselor would be able to pick up if there are um, if there are these kind of issues, and that's what we call as transference, you know, they transfer their emotional, uh, uh, emotional um, affections to the therapist, and so that those are some indications that a, a therapist or a counselor will be able to understand and you know deal with at that point of time. Even in professional uh, treatment, uh, if that happens, if that transference issue happens, the the counselor does. Uh, you know, uh, discuss that with the with the counselee and move them on to someone else who can be of help. Because you see that that's not going to help them. That journey of that relationship that the counselee may be having on the counsellor is not going to be helpful. So, so in the best interest of the counselee, they will be moved, released to somebody else. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Jean. I hope that. Uh... Answered your question, Kofi. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, if any of you all have any questions, any doubts, you need more clarity on what Gina shared, you can uh, please feel free to type it out in the chat section or you can unmute your mics and ask your doubts or your questions. Or you need more clarification, you can do so as well. I have a question, please. Um, I have read somewhere or somebody told me that uh, if a person is um, intending to commit suicide, they do uh, attempt sometimes, at least like once or twice, they try to attempt and then they find courage in it. Is it true or? So um, if, if, if you look at studies, it is true that uh, uh, people who have finally attempted suicide have had failed attempts uh, previously um, there could be either their measures that they that they've used or uh, the 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 plan that they've had has has probably not come through so then it is true that they they kind of work through a certain plan now, for people who have had multiple attempts of suicide, uh, um, there are two things I think we really need to consider. Is, um, uh, is the fact that there can be a significant mental health challenge, which means significant depression, substance abuse, 
um, even even something that we call as a personality mm -hmm. disorder, right? And uh, so this has to be attended to. So that's one thing that that when you do see people attempting suicide multiple number of times, um, we may just not be able to leave them and say, okay, they're okay now, they seem all right, and let go of them. They probably require constant support, constant help because um, because of their coping mechanisms. Uh, very often, if you if you look at uh, certain case studies, a lot of uh, people who attempt suicide have extremely poor coping mechanisms. And whenever there is, well, whenever there's a stress, there's poor frustra frustration tolerance. And as a result, this is what they think would help them through that. A lot of, uh, especially with personality disorders, people who have personality disorders, when they attempt suicide, uh, they, they haven't really thought through a plan. It is just to get rid of the emotional burden or the emotional struggle that they are that they are truly experiencing. Because uh, suicidal thoughts can be driven by a real overwhelming desire to escape that situation or emotional pain. So when they feel suicidal, I'm sorry, when they feel overwhelmed, it uh, distorts their they're thinking to the point that they are not thinking straight. And uh, it, it's important for them to realize that these are, like in, in what we would say, these are lies that are thrown at them. Uh, and these, these thoughts are entirely irrational. So, but for them to come to that place, they need to really uh, mellow down or subside from their emotional overwhelm. And that's why for those who have multiple uh, attempts, you do they they require regular constant help um you know in in way of support thank you jean uh, i hope that answered your question vivek yes please thank you thank you uh last week we had lyndon who wanted to ask a question and he's here on the call uh, and we didn't have time to uh, hear you out lyndon so uh, would you like to ask your question Okay, in the meantime, we'll uh, move on to Zelatoli. We'll wait for Lyndon to maybe unmute and ask or just type it in the chat section. Uh, Zelatoli Watsa's question is, can you share some practical ways to reach out to a person who has lost hope and shows suicidal tendencies in his or her conversation, especially if that person is a family member and doesn't value a person who wants to help? All right. Thank you, Zilatoli. Um, If you had uh, been through the presentation, there were some, some pointers that uh, we brought up. I'll just probably quickly highlight a few. Um, I'm taking to cognizance that you said doesn't value a person who wants to help. So what I see is you may want, you may desire to help the person, but they don't value you. Uh, but then you have seen that uh, there is probably a tendency. Um, I still think it is worth the while if you do the, the following things that, that we're going to discuss about. But if that doesn't help, enlist the support of some other family member that may be closer to the close to the person. You know, if they if they value somebody else or value um, listening to them, maybe enlist that support. But whether it's you or whether it's the the other family member, the first and foremost thing is to really show that you care and you you're concerned. And uh, if you have noticed that they have this uh, this tendency, as we as we had uh, spoken about, ask ask them where they are at, what is going on right now in their lives and and certain questions as we as i had spoken about the last time you can you can uh you can actually ask do you I, i've noticed that you know you've been really low over the last couple of weeks couple of days is there something that you'd like to like to share with me do you do you feel like you, you you've given up um have there been thoughts of uh, uh dying have there been thoughts of hurting yourself even asking, have you even thought about suicide? Um, and or if they do say yes, then you go about asking, um, how have how have you thought of doing it? Mm -hmm. Have you thought of how and when you're going to do it? Um, do you have any access to those weapons or to to the means 
that you're going to harm yourself. So uh, it's important to ask um, uh, as, as they're talking. And even as they share, it's important to take them seriously. Remember that even when they're sharing whatever they're going through, I think for us, we feel under the pressure of solving their problems. But you don't have to be under that pressure, just offering support and encouragement to talk to them about how they're feeling. So the first is just to ask uh, and being a listener. Uh, when you're listening, you're not you're not um, sidestepping whatever they, they're sharing with you. You're you're there completely focused on what they what they have. Um, now the next thing is even. Um, if if you were there last week, I played a clip about you know a, a man who um, who actually spoke about what really helped him, and in that clip he said um, it's not about throwing guilt, which means not saying hey you have a family, you have young children, um, you know, or or your uh, you know this is what you believe in, this is your faith. Actually, not throwing that guilt on them can be really, really helpful at that point of time. Just to step aside from that to just being in a place of just listening and being alongside with them. Uh, the fourth thing that you would need to do, especially um, if, uh, you know, if you do feel that there is a tendency that they could harm themselves, is to ensure that you get the support of someone in that home. Uh, so that uh, any kind of uh, measures to kill themselves, like knives or uh, or um, uh, toilet cleaners, any kind of uh, dangerous uh, material that's there, needs to be taken away, and you know a close watch over them and supporting them to get them into treatment. So even actually booking an appointment uh, for with a counselor, going alongside with them to a counselor, all of this are definite. You know, active indications that show that you care. Maybe just following up with them and asking them how they're doing. Um, you know, just spending some time just to ensure that they're moving away from where where they're at. So these are, I know these sound really simple, but these can be extremely effective for someone who is in such emotional overwhelm. Thank you, Jean. Uh, did that help, Salatoli? Jean shared. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Lyndon, uh, Martin, do you like to ask your question which you had last week? Or is it already answered? Anyone else would like to ask any questions? doubts you have clarity on what was shared? Uh, Pastor Selina, uh, no one has a question. Maybe I'd like to put forth a question uh, to, sure, to all the students because I think it just helps us to think. Um, uh, this is this is probably, let's say you, uh, you know, somebody you know has committed suicide, um, but you're dealing with the family. You're uh, uh, dealing with the pain that they're going through, the kind of questions that they may have. So um, just thoughts on what do you sense or what do you think uh, you would do if you were in a situation like this? And I'm, and I'm sure maybe some of you have already faced that, but uh, it's an important question to ask. What about survivors of those who've committed, uh, who've attempted and committed suicide? You know? So um, how do we, what do we do um, what are best things that we can do? So I'm, I'm actually going to bring up the question to you all so that you can just hear some thoughts and some I, uh, ideas. Thank you, Jean. Very relevant question. So we'll open it up to any of you who would like to share if you had you know, come face this kind of a scenario and what did you do? Or any of our fac faculties can uh, share their thoughts. Uh, hi, Jean. Hi, Sarina. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, I just had one thing. I think um, we just need to, so the family would be uh, under tremendous uh, guilt, I think, thinking that uh, they've not done enough or they should have, uh, you know, should have, could have, all those kind of scenarios. 
and they might be under a lot of guilt. So I think um, first thing to do would be to to address that. Uh, I'm not sure how sufficiently we can do that, but uh, I think the first thing would be to um, kind of address that. That's what comes comes to my mind. Yeah. Absolutely relevant, Master Jay Kumar. Anyone else would like to share? Uh, yes, Pastor Selina. Uh, so, Jean, uh, what Pastor Jekuma shared is good because they they might have a lot of questions. Uh, it would be good to address those questions. Uh, but also, I'm thinking maybe just being with them uh, and just being a support. And you know, at times when we also may not know what to say, to just be there and listen and help uh, could could help, uh, could could be a blessing to them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, I have uh, a suggestion that, um, you know, they are going through uh, so much uh, uh, sadness and that they have not done enough and all. But also talking to them, we could get uh, like how this happened and how for ourselves to learn from them to prevent for other suicide cases you know just getting like uh, like talking to them and getting like information to avoid in other circumstances yeah so um it's actually, I think one of the important things that you said uh, um, is, uh, um, you know, talk, getting them to talk, which is one of the most important things when someone is in grief, is to give them the space to share. And you may hear them sharing the same thing over and over and over again. They may have uh, a lot of... Uh, what ifs but you know what if i had done that what if i had done this um if only i had done this if only that you know you will hear that what if if only is a lot of lot of times so to help them uh, to grieve uh, and to uh, come in in knowledge of these emotions grief um uh, guilt uh, they take on blame you know, they take on a whole sort of a whole lot of blame because they didn't see it coming. So just allowing them to talk actually really is helpful. Um, yeah, we may not talk to them with the intention to have a learning experience for us. Maybe not at that time. Maybe yes, as a reflective thing is something we can look at. But having that conversation, just allowing them to really just openly share that grief and that pain, the guilt, all of that is very helpful. And not having to answer them, you know, when they're saying, uh, if only I had done this, or what if I had done that? Maybe saying, you know, you did the best you can, or you did, it, that may not cut it. It, it doesn't seem um, uh, supportive and empathetic at that time. It's just silence that probably can really work through all of this. And, you know, uh, like like Pastor Nancy said, staying with them through it, journeying uh, that, in that healing with them through it, because they may have multiple questions that will keep coming up, and it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I I don't know, I'm I'm not sure of that of, of what that is, but let's discover that together. Let's let's keep talking, or let's go and talk to somebody else to see if we, if we can get, or let's look back into scripture to see what we can find. So journeying with them through that is is a good thing. And you don't need to know everything as a counselor. You don't need to know all the answers. It's just important that you're there in that relationship with them. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar and Pastor Nancy and Mr. Getrude for sharing. Uh, Jean, I, I don't know if this is uh, right, but I think they would also be facing a lot of shame uh, because, you know, uh, people around them will be asking a lot of questions. So they would want to avoid people because they want to avoid them asking all uh, questions which they have to answer, which again will bring about that whole guilt and you know, that they were not competent enough to handle uh, the person and take care of them. So I think 
that's another area that uh, we can help them out. Absolutely, yes. yes. Thank you. So Lubega says, uh, I will invite a counselor friend to talk to the family and also be around to listen and learn. Uh, I do all this in fear of causing more harm than good. Okay, thank you, Lubega. Asapu Raj has a question. Uh, Jean, can we go on to Asapu's uh, question? Okay. Uh, is, that imp is, is it important to ask those questions like how they wanted to commit suicide, when and where, and how uh to how will it help us deal with the issue uh will not sorry okay so he's basically saying you know should we ask the person who's contemplating suicide when where and how you know will it just when we ask those questions it will help uh, the person deal with the issue or uh, you know will it not give them more ideas on how to commit suicide uh, when we ask those questions so that is asapu's uh, query yeah uh, thank you asapu it's a very relevant question because it's the fear of most people that if i were to ask are you considering suicide are you what means are you using then you've kind of reiterated their plan but that isn't true that's that's a common fear we may have but that isn't true evidence does show that um, uh, you know especially when people are in that phase they are looking for someone to understand someone to help and suicide an attempt to suicide is a cry for help so when someone actually asks them they um, I think in my practice over the years, there has never been a time when someone has not um, uh, has not shared what they are going through. They actually tell you, you know, they they will they will bring about uh, their plan. That is, if they have a plan, they will bring about it as you keep asking them, because as I said, it's an indication that showing them that there is someone who cares enough for them. To know that something is seriously wrong and that's why you're asking those questions so uh, you do, it, it is not true that they will have more means or more ways or more ideas to commit suicide when you talk to them about it when you're straightforward and sharing that they have a space where they can emotionally offload and that's what you're giving them you're giving them an opening to emotionally offload you're showing them that you are there to care you're showing them that you are there to support and help them through this that they are important enough for you to work this issue or this challenge with them i've i've always noted that this one line you're really important to me at this time just that much for them to hear that from somebody that someone someone sees them as important is enough for them to have you know a complete not not a complete withdrawal of these thoughts but at least a release at that point of time and yes after you do that you have to have an action plan right work along with them to have an action plan so sometimes what i do is i kind of have a like a contract i say you know um uh, would you would you would you uh, stay with me and uh, uh, for the next 24 hours can we can can you just uh, ensure that you drop me a message every one hour or if i don't hear from you can i drop you a message so i kind of build little contracts with them to to tie them over outside of that emotional pain because once that subsides then you're in a place to probably get them the real support and help that they need so you need a, a, a larger plan it's just not asking them the questions and maybe leaving them like that but either putting them to support with someone or you staying in as a support for a couple for a for a period of time till you know that the danger is passed and then you can actually get them some support and help so um that's a fear okay so it is not true that if you ask they will be more challenged or they will have better ideas to commit suicide i hope i hope you are able to pick that uh, pick that up pick that perspective thank you jean uh, did that help answer your uh, question asapu Thank you. Uh, anyone else has any more questions? You want to share anything? Please feel free to unmute or to post it in the chat section. 
I, I just have a, a quick question. Um, now, how do we you know, develop a preemptive um, you know, environment? Maybe at home, I'm just thinking about a home scenario where there could be teenagers growing up and you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, con content out there, I mean, like even suicide is suggested as a fantasy thing and stepping into another world kind of thing. So, um, so how do we build a, you know, uh, like a protective, preemptive kind of um, environment? Any thoughts on that, particularly with regard to suicide? Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Kumar. So um, if we're looking at... Uh, and, and I'd like to bring it back to a home context. Um, and it's so relevant what you asked, because if you look at young adolescents uh, at this point, uh, you know, in our, in our time right now, um, every home or most homes, I'm sorry, not every, most homes, you would have um, uh, young adults, adolescents at least having spoken of a death wish at some point of time. Um, because of, number one, the challenges that they go through, the changes that they go through, and the kind of pressure that is, and, and like you said, Pastor Jai Kumar, the kind of content content that is available for them. Um, some, some factors. The first and foremost thing is, yes, openness. To provide an environment where um, there is open sharing, where there is emotional vulnerability, vulnerability that children, parents can actually share about their personal journeys of how, um, of what is going on in their lives. So that, and how, from parents, how they have dealt with it or how they are finding ways to cope with it. So that open environment actually helps children or adolescents to see that there is a space or there is a parent who is there to understand my situation. The second is um, having conversations about these important things like, like drug abuse, depression, anxiety, suicide, self-harm, uh, actually opening up conversations about it because you're, it's done in a protective environment. Because you know, if, uh, uh, in schools, you will hear kids, um, I'm sure Pastor Selena will be able to corroborate this, you will hear kids talking with each other about how many times they've actually cut themselves, you know, self-harmed, uh, superficial cuts. That, that's what they're talking about. Or they will be, they will bring knives or they will bring blades to the school to actually show their friends what they like, what they've used. So, open conversations about it at home um, uh, to to really debunk, you know, the the uh, the glorification of something like that of what what it means to self-harm really can help. Because that's what when you when you do see all the adolescents come to counselors or to therapists, the first thing that they say is, "I'm scared to talk about this to um, to my to my uh, to my parents. I'm scared to do because you know how are they going to going to take it? How are they going to see it? So just having those open conversations is a is a huge relief for for people like that. The next is to note signs of depression now specifically especially in young adolescents the rate of depression and anxiety has uh, peaked up so much um, over the years again because of the kind of influences that are there so really knowing the first signs of of depression and getting them the support and the help that they need can again uh, reduce this uh, incidence of suicide Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar, uh, for your question. Uh, did that help answer your question, Pastor Jay Kumar? Okay, thank you. Asapu has a, a good question again. If a believer commits suicide and dies, will they go to heaven? Yeah, I, can I open it up to the other pastors? Yes. But yeah, I'll just I'll just add a line and then I will ask uh, you know any of the other pastors to support. Um, so in the way that I see it, and, and I hope uh, and, and I'm sure the pastors can help, is um, God's grace and mercy is 
beyond our understanding and uh, you know uh, and and what and it is it's unsearchable that's what it says we believe that uh, the atonement of christ has covered all our sins and every mistake that we we may have committed and we read that in hebrews uh, hebrews where it says he offered that single sacrifice um, for our sins for for all time so uh, which which includes all all of our sins so if we believe that christ sacrifices uh, sacrifice covers our sin this uh, i believe that the sin of uh, taking one's life may be not very different from from other sin so we have been redeemed by god and have been forgiven for our sins and assures us you know even in romans it assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus so uh, that's how i've understood it but i'd like to open it up for the rest of the pastors to uh, to comment thank you jean uh, just open it up for the other faculty they like to share New Father faculty would like to share on this? Sanjay, do you want to uh, share on this question or does you have another question? Yes, Pastor. I just wanted to add to Asapu's, uh, Brother Asapu's question because I had something similar to his question. Uh, so what I had learned many years ago was that uh, I, I might be wrong. I just need a clarification on this, that committing suicide is probably the unpardonable sin, or it's also associated with blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and it's something really serious. So could anyone throw light on this? I might be wrong. Th that's all I wanted to ask. Thank you, Sanjay. So he's just adding on to Asapu's uh, question. Uh, uh, just, whether uh, suicide, suicide is an unpardonable sin, and... Yes. Sorry, Pastor Ashish, please go uh, ahead. Can I, I'll just uh, try to say, say a few things very quickly. Uh, uh, see, in the eyes of God, any sin uh, has to be punished, you know, whether it's a lie or whether it's a murder, whether it's... Uh, and in, in the eyes of God, for example, hate is equal to murder. You know, in our mind, we think, oh, murder, you've killed a person. But in the eyes of God, hate hating a person is equivalent to murder. So just think about a scenario where a believer, uh, just you know, seconds before his death, has hate in his heart towards somebody, and then he dies. He doesn't have an opportunity to repent of that hate. So we ask the question, uh, will he go to heaven or will he go to hell? Because hey, he had hate in his heart, which is equivalent to murder. He didn't, ha he didn't repent because the next minute he had a heart attack or something and he died, will he go to heaven or hell? And this is where I agree with what Jean said, where, you know, it's it's God's grace. We are saved by grace through faith. And at that instant, just because a believer had hate in his heart or lust in his heart and didn't repent at that moment, but died the next instant, doesn't mean they're going to spend an eternity in hell. They are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. And so, you know, just thinking logically with that same reason, uh, a person who commits suicide, yes, there is a lot of premeditation that goes into it and the planning and all that. Uh, and it's actually, in many times, I mean, it's very complex, like we've been listening. Uh, there is fear, there's so on, there's unbelief, all of those kinds of things. And people use all of that to say, well, you know, this is an unpardonable sin, like Sanjay mentioned. Uh, but really, uh, uh, and obviously the person never had a moment to repent of it. They, they committed suicide at the end of their life. So they didn't have even think about saying, God, I'm sorry, or whatever. Uh, so the question is, if this person was a believer, this person is saved by grace. Yes, in that moment, they ended their life in this very confused, difficult, emotional, spiritual state. They didn't 
repent. But does that mean they will not be saved? So we think about the other scenarios. You know, if there was hate, if there was lust, if there was some other sin that a believer did not repent of before dying, would they be saved? Our answer is yes. And therefore, you know, in that same logic, in that same thought process, uh, this is my thought that, yeah, the person will be saved, even though they did something at that moment that, uh, you know, that ended their natural life. It's very complex, a lot of things, emotions going on, spiritual state, etc. Uh, but because if they really believe, they trust in Jesus as their Savior, uh, that's where, you know, the grace of God comes in. So this is my thought. I know, you know, there's no, like real chapter and verse we can say, if thou commit suicide, thou shalt be forgiven. There's no chapter in verse, but this is just my thought. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, thank you, Jean, uh, for sharing as well. And thank you, Asapu, for asking the question. I hope it answered your question. Uh, Jean, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to do back-to-back -back sessions. Uh, just uh, shows your passion that you have to help people and to counsel. Thank you so much for sharing from your expertise. Uh, we'll end the call here. Uh, thank you all for joining the call. Have a blessed uh, day. Uh, thank you, everyone.